So I was watching Puss in Boots The Last Wish with a friend. Real cute movie with a cool and somewhat brutal existential message, you know. Perfect for your casual Thursday morning. Then we got to this scene and I was like, wait, 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 that looks so familiar. It became clear that it was time to investigate. Could these colors have some hidden meaning? Okay, let's get right into it. I want you to take a look at this image from the movie. Now this. Do you see the resemblance? They are like colors of the rainbow, except for that white one over there, and maybe both the movie and the other picture I'm showing here just decided to use rainbow colors, right? However, the movie creators could have kept the crystals uncolored, used some uniform colors, or make each multicolored, I mean it's a really colorful movie. So I thought it might be worth looking into since the colors are so specific. So, about this picture. This is an illustration about the gothic horror short story called The Mask of the Red Death by Edgar Allan Poe. In the video description, you can find links to the story as text only, as a simplified version, and as an audiobook if you want to go ahead and read it first. And I recommend that you do it for the full experience. In this video, I'll be looking at the possible symbolism of these colors and making connections between the stories. I'll also do a quick summary now, spoilers ahead. Also, obviously, major spoilers for the movie throughout this video. Story starts with a disease outside, and people are literally dying. This dude named Prospero, well, a prince to be exact, thinks he can escape the plague and decides to go into lockdown with a thousand friends in a castellated abbey and have a masquerade party. How appropriate! This place has seven rooms of different colors. There's also an ebony clock in the black room, and each hour it makes a disturbing sound. And the people basically freeze, like in What's the Time, Mr. Wolf, disturbed by the sound. After the sound stops, they go back to what they're doing at the party. When the clock sounds at midnight, a masked figure appears and the people are like, <gasps> or Bleh. Prospero is angry at the figure since he thinks he's mocking them and chases him through the rooms with a dagger. The figure turns to face him in the last room and the prince goes, ah! Oh, then the figure who's revealed to be the Red Death kills everyone. <laughs> That's the end of the real quick summary. While I was watching the movie, I made a number of connections between it and the story, which I'll call here Mask for short. One obvious connection that I thought of the first time watching was how both seem to be about life and death, and how death is inevitable. As author Coleman put it, this story deals with the inevitability of death, and the futility of trying to avoid it. Man journeys through life, making his way from birth to death, and no matter how he may try to avoid it, man moves constantly toward the grave. Puss runs from death in the movie, but it catches up to him. Death comes for us all. You know we will meet again, right? The second connection is that the figure of death in the movie is also largely associated with the color red, like the red death. I was like freaking out at this point, like, whoa, isn't that so cool? Or warm in this case, because it's um, a warm color. <laughs> sure, one can argue that red is just a color that is clearly connected to blood and death. But we see another typical portrayal of death, like the Grim Reaper, in other movies, and death can simply be connected to black only instead. Oh, but Grim from the Grim Adventures of Billy and Mandy has some red on him, just like death in the movie has red eyes. Big deal. But yes, it's not just about his eyes, but the surroundings turning red twice. Here's the beginning scene. Red is like his main color. These two main connections gave me an extra push to make a video about it. Could the creators of the movie be referencing Mask? Also get this. Mask was apparently directly influenced by the Castle of Otranto by Horace Walpole, which is generally considered as the first gothic novel. My super cool friend discovered this and mentioned it. And in this story, a giant helmet falls on a guy from above and he dies. Reminds you of the giant bell crushing puss to death, doesn't it? What a catastrophe! 
that's not all okay. Let me read another part of the novel. It was Diego who saw it, my lord. It was not I, replied Jacques. I only heard the noise. Diego had no sooner opened the door than he cried out and ran back. I ran back too and said, Is it the ghost? The ghost! No, no, said Diego, and his hair stood on end. It is a giant, I believe. He is all clad in armor, for I saw his foot and part of his leg, and they are as large as the helmet below in the court. As he said these words, my lord, we heard a violent motion and the rattling of armor as if the giant was rising, for Diego has told me since that he believes the giant was lying down, for the foot and leg were stretched at length on the floor. Like, aren't these connections crazy? Also, it's called... The sleeping giant of Del Mar! Del Mar means of the sea in Spanish, and the Otranto in Castle of Otranto is a coastal town in Italy, and, you know, near the sea. Even if Mask wasn't inspired by the novel, because I couldn't really find more sources saying this through the search terms I used in Google Scholar, a movie creator could have read and been inspired by great gothic works, including Mask and Otranto, then referenced these works in the movie. I'm saying that an overall link to gothic works could support the idea that they are referencing Mask in the movie. But that's just speculation, though the similarities are undeniable. I didn't go and read the whole book, by the way, so there might even be more connections to discover. If one of you knows a novel, let me know. It could be cool. Also, any idea if his eye patch means anything? Antlers? What's that, a drum kit? But anyway, with the connections between the movie and mask mentioned earlier, let's see now if there's a link between the colors in them. Of course, in the movie, we know what the different colored crystals represent. Puss recognizes them as this. So you are my former lives. Reflections of the good old days. Death confirms it. Your past lives, or your past deaths, as I like to call them. If the movie creators are referencing Mask, then they might use ideas from interpretations of the colors in the short story that you can find easily on, like, Google. Spoilers ahead again about the analysis of Mask. If you want to crack a puzzle and try to figure it out by yourself, then you should go do that first. Okay, so here we go with the answers! I checked out sources on the first page of General Google and on Google Scholar. Many of them interpreted the colors of the rooms in Mask to generally symbolize different phases of life as well, as stated or referenced in the sources by Bell, Crocken, Coleman, Fisher, Coleman, and Live Web Tutors. So you see, in Puss, it's similar, as the crystals show different phases in his whole nine lives. In Bell's interpretation, the colors are specifically about Prince Prospero's life, and not everyone's, which is comparable to how the crystals in the movie are about Puss's lives. Also, the crystals kind of look like the style of the colored windows in Mask. Now, the interpretations about what each color symbolizes do vary, and some critics don't think they have meaning at all or that they are random and are collectively used for some other purpose, such as visual shock. Actually, there was a pretty cool article I read that mentions an argument for why the colors don't have meaning. And if you want to look more into it for fun or for more perspectives, then it's in the video description. But in many sources I looked at, like in that list of author names I mentioned earlier, the blue room represents birth, while the black room with red windows indicates blood, disease, that is red, and death, that is black or were once confronted most directly with death, or mental degradation leading to insanity. And the other rooms are the phases of life between those two. Blue can be about the unknown, and a closeness to divine truths, or the divine since Poe apparently linked blue to this in his other works, and it is thus connected to birth, or a pre-birth existence. In his story, Poe also writes, when talking about the Red Death, Blood was its avatar and its seal, the redness and horror of blood. And his vesture was dabbled in blood, and his broad brow, with all the features of the face, was besprinkled with the scarlet horror. About the Red Room, Poe says, The panes here were scarlet, a deep blood color. 
Also in the movie, the way that death destroys all the crystals and red covers up the rest reminds me of the closing line from Mask. And darkness and decay and the red death held illimitable dominion over all. Where death is covering everything. Now to again bring up the arrangement of the room colors in the story, it's blue, then purple, then green, orange, white, violet, and finally black with red windows. So Bell's interpretation is that purple is Prince Prospero's phase of life where he accomplished something, before the prime years. Purple represents maturity, or the start of development, and also, like blue, a closeness to divine truths in an early stage of life, or Prince Prospero's royalty acquired at birth, being associated with nobility. Vanderbilt believes that it represents the quickening of life. Next, green can represent life and vigor, and Prospero's prime years, growth into adulthood, and the season of spring when new life begins to emerge and is the prime time for development when individuals are young. Green can be growth and aspiration in youth, and youth in vitality, though there's a tradition where it represented insanity. Orange can be Prospero's autumn of life, or the midday of life. It can represent the season of fall and the high noon of existence, according to Vanderbilt or a transition to adulthood with negative connotations of lust and wantonness, according to Zimmerman. As the center room, it's that point in life where you're halfway between being young and elderly, and can serve as a warning of death, just like fall is to winter. So winter is the next thing represented by white, as some argue, and it can signify old age, where your hair is white. It can mean complete development, or disease and impending death, according to Zimmerman. Vanderbilt phrases white as decline, old age, decomposition, approaching death. Getting even closer to death, violet is the gravity and soberness of extreme age and the chastity that goes along with it, or where death becomes more real. Violet can be somberness and being ready for the end, or mourning and death attached to royalty. Violet is opposite to green on the color wheel, which can represent not the transition from death to life in the spring, but rather the transition from life to death in the fall. <laughs> cool interpretation! Some people thought that Poe was referencing or took the idea of Seven Ages of Man from Shakespeare with his Seven Rooms, which is where some of these interpretations could be coming from. Also, my friend pointed out that it's cool how blue and violet are like mirrors of each other, since blue is the first room and the beginning of life, while violet is the second last room before death and represents the last state of living. Both this infantile and extremely old age comes with a dependence and limitedness in function. Okay, anyway, if it was the movie creator's idea not to copy everything, but they maybe got inspiration from Mask and are maybe referencing it, and there must be eight cat lives while there are only seven rooms in Mask, then there can and must be an extra color. If red is also blood and death, then pink can be the color nearer to death. It's associated with Puss's eighth life, and is shown in this scene with red flames in his fight with this red death. My friend organized Puss in Boots' order of lives and deaths and connected them to the colored crystals. He linked the first, let's call it death, to the violet one. Puss seems flirty with those rose petals, right? The second death is clearly indicated by the playing cards in the green crystal, and the third by the hat in the turquoise or blue crystal. The buff fourth puss is of course in the white crystal. The fifth and seventh are unclear since they have no object shown in the first death scene to serve as visual signs, so let's leave them for now. The sixth death was connected to the puss that died of eating, which the red crystal seems to show, and the eighth, of course, connected to the puss with the guitar in the pink crystal. 
I thought that the first death could also be in the red crystal, since it has a red scarf, and in the death scene and crystal scene, they both mentioned gazpacho. Do you like gazpacho? Uh, gazpacho? In the end, the red one is still more fitting, though, because of how much he's into food. And it could be one of Puss's favorite foods anyway. Now we have these left. The fifth death can be connected to the yellow crystal, since he's so stunty, or especially Daredevil, shooting himself out of that cannon and waving that sword. Then about the seventh death. While we don't see any death in the beginning scene looking into a mirror like in the purple crystal, the remaining death did look at the oven glass before dying. So yeah, those are the possible guesses. If the crystals are then compared with mask, then this could be blue, this could be green, skip pink, then a sort of blue or light violet. There's no crystal which could be black and showing death, since Puss didn't lose his last life yet. So perhaps we can say that there is not one but two extra colors representing Puss's lives. Since there's another extra besides pink, we might be able to count the yellow and red shown as orange. For the sake of exploration, okay? <laughs> Stick with me. Let's just say this color is violet too, for now. So then, if we look at the order of the crystals in the circle, they aren't in the same order as the rooms in Mask though. If I connect the rooms by order, with yellow coming after red to make orange, then I get a cool little design, but that's about it. <laughs> Here's how different the order is, with the order of rooms in Mask on the inside, and the order of Puss's deaths on the outside. There doesn't seem to be any clear pattern, even if we grant that this is violet, and that yellow and red can count as orange. The blue crystal doesn't show Puss's first life, the green crystal doesn't come after the purple one, the purple one isn't second to last, et cetera. It doesn't seem like the movie's crystal colors symbolize the same things as in the interpretations of the rooms in Mask. There's also the scene where death shatters the crystals one by one in some sort of order, but the orders of crystals and rooms still don't match. I think it's cool to explore and learn about the ideas mentioned earlier about each room's meanings anyway. You have a hypothesis or a supposition about the order of the rooms from life to death, or specific color meanings, and it doesn't always have to be proven. However, some critics who interpret Poe's story also don't think that specific colors have meaning, right? The colors in Puss could just have a collective meaning, or a purpose of referencing Mask, without being a copy of the story. The theorizing about the movie referencing Mask doesn't end here, though. I made some other connections between the movie and story, even if specific colors don't line up. But like, even if there's no referencing going on, it's kinda cool to point out the similarities. But before moving on, and still talking about the crystals, the movie might have number symbolism like in Mask. Puss is called Number nine. Nueve. In other scenes, he's called Good looking, amigo. Puss. Puss in boots. Puss in boots. So it's not necessary to call him a number, but it serves as his special identifier. The number of lives or deaths could have significance. Proper party now that all nine of us are here. Yeah. <laughs> there are seven rooms in Mask, and some people have connected them to the seven ages of man, as mentioned earlier, and the seven deadly sins. Though apparently few believe this theory because there's not enough supporting evidence. Well, my friend actually proposed the idea that Puss's former lives might relate to the seven deadly sins without having even read about mask analyses and knowing how some people connected the story to the seven deadly sins. So there could be something there about how Puss in Boots might relate to the Seven Deadly Sins. Since there are eight deaths though, could there be an eighth deadly sin? Some sites count Despond as the eighth, which is to be very sad because you lose hope, when I suppose the person should be trusting in God. For simplicity, let's call it hopelessness, even though I don't think that might be summarizing the idea fully. So my friend pointed out how deaths 2 and 5 clearly show greed and gluttony, respectively, and the purple crystal clearly shows vanity. 
He thought that death number one, where puss flirts with the woman, could show lust, and death five could show sloth because no need to pull into port. He could just use the fast cannon. This will revolutionize travel. Yeah, when I was a kid, I wanted a teleportation machine so that I didn't have to waste money and effort going to the airport. <laughs> What's left is wrath and envy. I think wrath could be death four, actually, in the silver crystal. This puss looks angry and is a typical depiction of a macho man, which involves excessive aggression, which includes anger. My friend said that the third death could be despond, since it's the only one left that's kind of fitting. Throughout the movie, Puss is shown drinking a lot of heavy cream when he's upset, or sad, or alone. What's left is envy, which would then be assigned to the remaining death in the pink crystal. I don't think it fits though, and I don't think the other deaths can really fit envy either. I mean, one could say that Puss wanted the governor's possessions and taking his place for a party Mi casa es su casa. then destroying his portrait out of spite. Though, I don't think the connection's that strong because he could be treating the governor like this for other reasons. Like, of course, one could say that he's disrespecting the rich who ignore or mistreat the poor. The last death fits with a kind of pride, actually. The other one that was assigned pride before is like vanity and pride in appearance, while this one is about achievements. He proudly proclaims that the legend will never die and lives recklessly. The lyrics in the beginning scene also talk about him being humble. So unbelievably humble. While he shows the opposite. Even though some things don't seem to fit this theory at the end, it's kind of cool and I'm just sharing ideas. Okay, so I hate to do this, but I realize that this video is getting a little longer, so I'm going to have a next video that talks about the other connections between the two stories. Explore with me later. Bye!